So in the previous class we had seen the basics of radar. In this class we are going to see the applications of radar in a specific types. Okay, before the starting of the applications of the radars in specific types, we need to see some of the basic terminology. So for that we should be familiar with this types of radar. So what is a radar is we had seen then we need to see the types of radar. So there are two different types of radars being available. One is imaging based radar, the second one non-imaging based radar. Imaging based radar, the best example is that the satellite based radar altimeters which are being deployed in satellites for low spatial resolution with vertical high resolution. Whereas this non imaging radar is also used in plan position indicator. So this plan position indicator PPI radars use a rotating antenna to detect targets or a circular area such as next radar. Next radar or called as next RDA. So where the antenna which is present in the satellite or in the aircraft will rotate so with a circular area so depending upon the circular area it will identify what target is present then this non-imaging radar uses a traffic police is used in traffic police they use a hand held doppler radar system to determine the speed of speed by measuring the frequency shift between transmitted and written microwave signals. So these are used in foreign countries to detect how much speed the vehicle is moving across them. And the next is your imaging radar. So imaging radar uses uh, images which is of high spatial resolution. So this consists of a transmitter, a receiver, one or more antennas, GPS and the computers for computing. So this will have uh, cameras being fixed along with the microwave frequencies such that it can give more higher resolution. So this is the radar nomenclature. We have the aircraft or the airplane. We have the surface of the ground. So this flight which is in motion or the aircraft which is in motion is the asymptotic flight direction. So the flight is moving in this direction. So from that point, to the 90 degree, we have the altitude above the ground level H. Which is defined as altitude above ground level H. So this. So the point where it meets is your nadir point. Nadir, N-A-D-I-R, which is given is your first point, nadir. When the angle from where we observe to the near region or the near range and the far range is being deployed as here as shown figure. So which has the pulse of microwave energies, the microwaves which are being transmitted from here, the pulse and a near and far range depression angle gamma is here. So with this nomenclature, you can see here in the left hand side diagram, we have the look angle, near range, mid range, far range, the radar is present. So this radar will detect this mountain or this image along its motion. So this hilly region is being identified using microwave frequencies. So the definition of all these things is that azimuth direction is the direction of travel of aircraft or orbital track of satellite, whatever might be deployed. Range angle is the direction of radar illumination by the source, which is always perpendicular to azimuth direction. Then the depression angle, the angle between horizontal plane and microwave pulse, which is near range depression angle should be greater than the far 
range depression angle. So that we call it as depression angle. Angle between the horizontal plane and the microwave pulse that reaches the earth surface. Then incident angle, the angle between microwave pulse and a line perpendicular to the local surface slope is incident angle. Polarization is the next terminology of the nomenclature. The linearly polarized micro energy emitted or received by the sensor. I mean uh, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, vertical, or vertical, horizontal. So we will see that uh, polarization in detail also. Next is the slant range versus the ground range. So, what is ground range is that you can see from the diagram this is your ground range along the surface of the earth. So, the radar or the satellite, whichever is being present in the aircraft or in the satellite, so that when it is focused towards the object or the target, it gives your slant range. So, the radar imagery has a different geometry than produced by the most conventional remote sensor systems. Therefore, one must be careful when attempting to make radar gra gramometry or geometry measurements correctly. So, the uncorrelated radar imagery is displayed in the slant ridge geometry, which is the actual distance from the radar to each of the respective features in this scene. Based on the actual distance from the radar to each of the respective features in this scene is your slant range geometry. So it is possible to convert the slant edge display into true ground edge display on the x-axis. So that features in the scene are in their proper planimetric x, y position that is related to one another in the final radar image. So you can see that radar is there, either deployed in aircraft or satellite is present in space. So the mountain is being mountain is to be target or is the target. So with the help of that ground range and this land range, we are focusing towards the object or the target which is to be determined. So that can be converted into ground range also, which gives x comma y positioning of the radar image. So during this, there could be some errors being occurring, which is first one is your geometric errors. So in the geometric errors, the first one is your radar layover. At near range, <coughs> the top of a tall object is closer to the antenna than it is base. You can see A, B, B dash and C. It, Top of a tall object is closer to the antenna than its base. So, if any buildings or any high towers, if they are present, so from the surface, it will be obviously present within height. So, that will occur as a radar layover. So, as a result, the echo from the top of the object reaches the antenna before echo from the base. So this radar in satellite or uh, aircraft will send signals towards the ground or towards the object. So in between that it will fall on something and the signals will be reflected back. But it will also fall on the nearby surfaces and it will reflect lately. So the echo created due to this top of a tall object will create some errors. So those errors are radar layover. So because the radar can measure only slant range distances AB and BC projected on the slant range represented by the line BAC. You can see these lines BAC. You can see the radar for shortening. It occurs in period of modest to high relief, this despite in the mid 
to far range portion of an image. Okay, this land edge representation illustrates ABC in their correct relationships ABC, capital ABC and small ABC. But the distances between them are not accurately shown. You can see that these distances are not accurately shown. So whereas AB is equal to BC in the ground edge domain, AB less than BC when they're projected in this land range. Next is the polarization. The polarization of the radiation is also an important so which we had seen here in the radar nomenclature. Polarization. So there are four combinations of polarization. So before that, we'll see uh, what is polarization is. So polarization of a radiation is the orientation of the electric field. Most radars are designed to transmit microwave radiation either horizontally or vertically. Horizontal, you know the positioning along the x-axis, vertically along the y-axis of a graph. So similarly, the antenna receives direction or the signals either through the horizontal or vertical polarization. So with the backscattered energy from the illuminated source. And some radars can receive both, either horizontally and vertically also. So there are four combinations of both transmit and receive polarization, which is given as HH, VV, HV, VH, as said earlier. So HH is your horizontal transmit, horizontal receive. VV is vertical transmit, vertical receive. HV is horizontal transmit, vertical receive. And VH is your vertical transmit and horizontal receive. First, indicates your transmit. H is your horizontal. Second, represents your receive. So horizontal receive. So with that, you can identify it easily. So the first two polarization combinations are referred to as polarized. So HH and VV are polarized, whereas HV and VH are referred to as cross polarized. Next is the types of imaging radar. So there are two different types of imaging radar. One is side looking airborne radar, SLAR. Next one is the synthetic aperture radar, SAR. So we had seen a small introduction about this SLAR and SAR in the previous class also. So we'll be seeing in depth concepts of this, both the radars. So this SLAR, first we'll see, was developed in the 1950s, which is an airborne fixed antenna width that sends one pulse at a time and measures whatever the signals that scattered back. So the resolution is determined by the wavelength and antenna size where the narrow antenna width is equal to high resolution. Synthetic aperture radar was also developed by those responsible for a side looking airborne radar but the configuration is not dependent on the physical antenna size although in order to achieve a higher resolution the receiving antenna components and transmitter components need to be separated. So a synthesized procedure is being used for a very broad antenna by sending multiple pulses. You can see in the radar shadow, the look direction, look angle. 
the direction at which the radar signal strips the landscape is important in both natural and man-made landscapes. So the look angle, which is the depression angle of the radar, varies across an image from relatively steep at the near range side of the image to relatively shallow at the far range side. In natural landscapes, look directions especially important when terrain features display preferential alignment. The look directions are perpendicular to topographic alignment that will tend to maximize radar shadow, whereas look directions are parallel to topographic orientation that will tend to minimize radar shadow. You can see the depression angle which is present and the look angle which is present the near region, far region focusing of your radar satellites. So the, the more concepts of this uh, radar you will be studying in uh, next uh, semester under radar and navigational aids. If you choose that subject as your elective. Backscattering is a principle. The portion of the outgoing radar signal that the target redirects directly back towards the radar antenna is termed as backscattering. You can see aircraft is there. So that aircraft is sending a signal towards the target. So the target redirects back towards the radar antenna. So that we call it as backscattering. So when a radar system transmits a pulse of energy to the ground A, it scatters off the ground in all directions C. Let's see here in the diagram C. The portion of the scattered energy is directed back towards the radar receiver B. And this portion which is being scattered back directly towards the antenna or towards the aircraft is referred to as backscatter. And the principle is called as backscattering. Next terminology in radar is your speckle. You all are familiar with speckle, reflection and diffuse reflection, I think so. So the same is being used in your radar. So the SAR images are subject to fine textured effects that can create a grainy salt and pepper appearance when viewed in detail called speckles. This speckle is created by radar. Illumination of separate scatters that are too small to be individually resolved. You can see specular reflection is this A and it reflects back. It reflects back. So that is A, which is your specular reflection we are seeing. So then is the diffuse scattering. When the signal falls on this type of surface, you can see that this type of surface, it scatters. So this is your diffuse scatter. So this third one is your corner reflection. You can see in the diagram. And satellite or an aircraft sends the signals. So the signals fall on it, on the surface like this, and it goes in this, like this. So like this, imaging radar also can be done. So this is called as corner reflector. Or corner reflection. So then volume scattering. So volume scattering is a scattering of radar energy within a volume or medium, which consists of multiple bounces and reflections from different components within the volume. You can see that. Here there is a tree. So the you 
can see that the trees are present the branches the leaves the trunk all gets signals from the radar or the aircraft and then it scatters in a different volume level so depending upon the trees composition that will give multiple bounces with that you can find volume scattering this is what volume scattering is you can see speckle appears as a noisy fluctuations in brightness fading and speckle are inherent noise like processes which degrade image quality in a coherent imaging system so local constructive and destructive interference appears in the image as bright and dark speckles respectively local constructive will appear as bright you can see that is bright spots or your local constructive destructive interference appears in dark speckles you can see that dark 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 points are your destructive interference so in the using the independent data sets of this speckle the estimation of the same ground patch can be done by averaging independent samples so that can reduce the effects of speckle so which can be done by this methods first method is multiple look filtering can be used that separates the maximum synthetic aperture into smaller sub apertures generating independent looks at target areas based on the angular position of the targets therefore looks are different with the doppler frequency bands and this effects of speckle can be reduced by averaging adjacent pixels the left hand side right hand side top bottom all together if you take an average will get an improvement in that pixel then reducing these effects enhances radiometric resolution at the expense of spatial resolution so these two methods can be deployed for reducing speckle let's see an example of the constructive interference and destructive interference so this dotted line this dotted line in the way is your coherent radio radar waves which is being passing when it reflects back or when it scatters back to the sender or the transmitter you can see this wave which is being going in this direction we will get a constructive interference like this so this is your result this dashed line this dashed line is your constructive interference so as you can see in the destructive interference due to the reflection or due to the scattering so the result will be like this you can see at the center so this will become an intersimple interference you can see that i pattern as you are studying digital communication i pattern will occur <coughs> then you can see the constructive interference will look like this the constructive interference will look like this and homogeneous target homogeneous target means that all the planes are being equal for that all the plane surfaces are equal the target is like that you can see that this is your constructive interference this is a destructive interference so the bright spots will show us the constructive interference and the <coughs> dark spots is your destructive interference so the variation between the degrees of interference can be shown like this in these two colors averaging so an example of the radar image that found coherent for a noise like structures you can see that this uh, pictures two pictures are taken of uh, the help of a radar from around 300 meters okay and the first one is a corn field an image is taken by the radar for a corn field and the second is the for a forest you can see that 
how much brightness are there for in a cornfield how much darkness are there for a forest so the radar images are formed coherently and therefore inevitably have a noise like appearance so this implies that a single pixel is not representative representative of the back scattering so we need to do averaging you can see that so this corn field is an uniform why right? because whatever we show the corns in the field which will do it in an uh, equal manner same time we'll do it same time we'll water it same time we will grow all the corns will have an uniform growth so this is an example of the spatially uniform target fine texture when we look it so the forest will be present depending upon the climatic changes so you know, all the seeds are not being put up uniformly it never grows uniformly depending upon its age depending upon its growth depending upon its availability of water it will grow in like this some will grow very fast some will grow very slow some will not get sufficient water some may get sufficient water so this is the forest which is a non uniform target next is the penetration of the radar signals you can see x band is been given in blue c band is given in gray l band is given in red and uh, the return signals in this is a k band okay which uses multipolarization so the response of radar to vegetation and subsurface horizons is this topic you can see that here when we use a x band this much if trees are present till this it will reflect back what can it look like this in c band it will reflect like this and this is your texture for uh, same trees when you use l band it could penetrate till this in l band it could penetrate till this so you can see that this much from here it reflection will take place so when you use multipolarization like the hh hvvh and vv this could reflect till this grassroots you can see that till the depth of the soil penetration of radar signals at different frequencies multi frequency and multipolarization so this is an uh, image at the top the image at the bottom where you can see the image at the top was acquired through a thick cloud cover by space bond imaging radar c band or x band using this scr synthetic aperture radar which was uh, deployed in space shuttle endeavor on april 16 1994 so the bottom is an optical photograph taken taken optical photograph of the taken of the same place the same place by the endeavor crew under clear conditions during the second flight of sir c x sir on october 10 1994 there is a huge difference taken during a cloudy period taken during a clear period so any queries tell this you can type in chat box if there are any queries till this slide you can type in chat box then i'll proceed on to the next talk
Okay, since there are no doubts or queries, I proceed on to the next slide. So this is an example of an airborne radar. Airborne radar, which is used for monitoring sea surfaces. You can see that uh, when the aircraft is being uh, passing over an uh, ocean or a sea or a river body, if the radar sends signals, and it reflects back within a particular time. You can see, I can say that it is a clean sea surface. And if the surface is an oil sink, you can see that the signal will never return back in that slant range. So this means that how much amount of this is being sinked off by oil can be easily determined. When this aircraft moves in this direction or it rotates or it goes back or no, in what direction it goes. Till its coverage, we can identify how much amount of oil is being spread out in the sea. Meaning is that the ship which is taking or which is handling uh, transportation of oil is being Yes, Sai Krishna. Okay. So, uh, depending upon the coverage of the oil sink, we can uh, estimate how much amount of oil is being spelt out in the sea or the river on the ocean. So meaning that the shipment of oil from one place to another place, that a ship has been met with an accident or there is a leakage from that oil tanker or the oil grid rings which are present for example in Mumbai we have an oil ring it is digging oil from uh, ONGC so how much amount of oil spilling is done it can easily identify how much range and appropriate measures can be done so this is how as we had seen earlier we have an uh, optical laser scanner with uh, GPS positioning X Y Z positioning X is your latitude Y is your longitude and uh, that is your altitude so it can position it easily in what place what is present okay you have the digital camera for imaging we have the laser scanner for scanning the devices and we have the irs deployed in the aircrafts or in the satellite so this is a swath period you can see that the swath width is inclination angle of a digital camera and uh, for laser scanner, we have this inclination angle. So, this is an uh, SLR radar image and a corresponding photo being taken during an oil pollution at sea. You can see the first image, first image, some values. So, spillings like this. You can see the spilling, no spilling. Here it is being spilt out, oil is spilt out. This can be, this is being found out by the SLR radar image as you see here. This is that image. So you can see the center like this, it's going. The SLR radar image and its corresponding photo for an oil spill taken. So, 
either it could be crude oil or it could be a fossil fuel what or might be it is being spilled in this sea so that is being polluted this is what we had already seen the flight path the slant range the ground range the altitude look angle swath width main beam instant angle near region and the far region how to look in the near region how to look at the near swath and at far region it will look as your far swath and in between that is your mid swath this is how scanning occurs so the typical characteristics of an uh, airborne sla uh, like looking radar has micro frequency of 10 gigahertz wavelength 3 cm radar pulse of 15 nanoseconds radar pulse peak power of 10 kilowatts radar pulse repetition frequency of 50 hertz antenna length of 3 meter antenna horizontal beam width of 0.5 and antenna vertical beam width of 3 meter these are the specifications geometry of an slar operation and resolved surface area using the along track resolution the radar equation the slr and electrical specifications for a horizontal beam width which is less than 0.6 degree vertical beam width 19 plus or minus 3 degrees gain of 33 decibels with plus or minus 1 polarization is vertical size of the antenna is 12 feet frequency of operation is 9.375 gigahertz plus or minus 30 megahertz on the slr trans receiver will have the following electrical specifications 9375 plus or minus 39 megahertz the pulse range frequency of 0 to 2000 hertz pulse width of 250 nanoseconds plus or minus 10 percentage magnetron peak power of 27 kilowatts nominal that could vary from 22 to 32 kilowatts bandwidth is adjusted for pulse width the noise figure is given around 4.2 decibels the supply voltage is given of 20 to 30 volt dc the power consumption of less than uh, 126 watts is being there so this slr uses an uh, structure like this we have the phased array antenna it sends signals to the duplexer then it is given to your power amplifier we have the transmitter section in the aircraft or the satellite where pulse wave from are being sent to the power amplifier with the help of sine wave modulator and that is being sent to your duplex to the phased array antenna so this phased array antenna at receiver will obtain the signals gives it to the gives it to the band pass filter low noise amplifier doppler filter and with the velocity of the frequency of the source it goes on to the intermediate frequency stage amplifier then to the phase detector which is present in the moving target which we want to find then to the envelope detector and image rectification then threshold detection then superimposition and display in your display unit or to the computers or super computers which monitor them If you, if it is a moving target, if it is a stationary target, the target is stationary. From the Doppler filter, it is given to a Doppler filter again. Then to the envelope detector, image rectification, threshold. If necessary, we give it to the RCS line transformer. Then to the superimposition. Then it is being displayed to your computers.
Okay, since there are no queries for SL, SLAR, we have further monitoring SCAR. So synthetic aperture radar. So we have the red antenna, which is being present. We have the duplexer. Then it is given to the receiver. Then we have the demodulation or the other traditional conversion, which is given to a SAR processor. So here we have the radar control controlling all these structures depending upon the motion motion measurement sensor it gives information to the radar control so then we have the pulse generation then the sender it transmits the signals so mostly airborne or spaceborne SLAR are being present a simulation of a larger antenna or aperture, aperture electronically is being done here. This generates high resolution remote sensing imaginary. The pulse generation creates pulses with a bandwidth according to the range resolution. The sender amplifies the pulses and transfers it to the antenna via a circulator or the duplexer. So the re receiver amplifies the output signal of antenna and applies a bandpass filter. After the demolition procedure and the analog digital conversion, the SA processor calculates the SAR image where the radar controls the control unit, which is used for arranging the operation sequence, particularly the time schedule of what time, which time, and when it is being used. So, this is an example of your. Uh, the CR, we have a two dimensional image being present, which is being captured on the surface of the earth. You can see that. So, that 2D image is being obtained by the flight path versus the range data, which is given to a Hilbert transform, a calibration matrix, a matched filter, then a slot migration, then to the 2D image, which will look like this. Example of an optical remote sensor. For optical remote sensing, we require source energy as sun. So probably in daylight or in daytime, this optical remote sensing is used very drastically and it gives more efficiency. Whereas during nighttime, this optical remote sensing fails because there is no source of light at all. So the sun which is illuminated source falls on the tall spending reflex gives information to the satellite. It falls on the paved roads, asphalt roads, it gives information to the satellite. So bare soil will reflect with an angle. Grass will reflect with an angle. Water will reflect with an angle. The forest or trees will reflect with an angle. So all this reflected area, reflected solar radiation, which is being sensed by the satellites. So during daytime. So this is your optical remote sensing. So the optical remote sensing with SCAR. We are going to see. So this is SCAR is independent of cell illumination. Without sun also, this SCAR will work. This will not affect most of the atmospheric particles. The accurate distance measurement will be obtained. The subsurface penetration will be obtained. So these are sensitive to dielectric properties like water, biomass, ice, surface roughness, ocean, wind, speed, man-made objects, sensitivities, target structure, depending upon the structural details. So all these are the advantages of your SAR versus optical remote sensing. Due to this principle, which is returned energy. So the angle of the surface to the incident radar beam, where these are strong from facing areas, weak from areas facing away. The incident energy are stronger from the facing areas and it is weaker for the areas which are facing away. So the physical properties of the sensed surface are your surface roughness, and the dielectric constant. 
return energy will move from the smoothness surface to the roughness surface depending upon this smoothness will have lambda by 25 sin beta where h is the surface height variation roughness will have uh, surface height variation greater than lambda by 4.4 sin beta where beta is the depression angle so lambda is the wavelength of the radar image geometry so this is an uh, example of an oil splink in glacier spring you can see 50 kilometers attitude in 2002 this is your oil spill oil pollution we see water. This is in Los Angeles. See here are the mountains. These grey structures which are peak in nature are mountains. These are your plain surfaces. Here are these pills. Here this place. Response to oil moisture. The SER details of field one and two is that the white pixels reflects or white cells white pixels uh, gives information about areas of very high backscatter due to the presence of subsurface water. The linear picture running through field 2 shows radar representation of a spring season. Okay. Then response to crop moisture, you can see the SAR image of this is being given here. This image where there is huge amount of water being flowing, so that is being in situ irrigation that is being taken as a pixel. You can see this how it will looks in a CR image. It shows that there is abundant subsurface water there, determining the moisture level of crops. And this you all are familiar. The types of scattering of radar from different surfaces. Incident wave on a smooth surface and rough surfaces. How it acts in two different bands, L band and X band, you can see. So the left hand side diagrams are all X band, X band uh, and the right side is L band. So if it is a smooth surface, it will reflect like this. If it is a rough surface, if it is it will scatter and diffuse like this. So when it is more rough surface, it will go like this. In X band, which varies from 2.4 centimeter to 3.75 centimeter. Whereas L band 15 to 30 centimeter. This research was done by uh, uh, Environmental Research Institute of Michigan. They, are, they had used two different bands of doing uh, radar reflection from the surfaces of varying roughnesses. Backscattering. Canopy backscattering, you can see. These are incident which falls on the trees and due to multiple reflections or corner reflections, it will reflect back, which we call as canopy backscattering. So this is soil backscattering. So this will fall and it will reflect as it is. So soil trunk reflection. You can see that here is your corner reflectors from the tree and as well as from the soil. Canopy soil reflection. 
So this is calibration of an SAR, synthetic aperture radar. So which emphasis on radiometric calibration to determine the rad radar across the sections. So the calibration is done in the field using test sites with appropriate transponders. Inside, you can see that this is the SCAR. You can see this plus point, which is shown here. In this brightness is what is being expanded here, which is zoomed here. You can see that this. The applications that is used in the snow mapping, crop classification, forest biomass, or timber estimation, wave height monitoring, soil moisture mapping, crop yielding, crop stress, flood prediction, landslide prediction. Any queries in this SCLR and SCR, you can type in chat box.
since since there are no further queries i move on to the last topic of unit number 3 so which is radiometer and its geometrical characteristics radiometers this microwave radiometers are very sensitive receivers that are specifically designed to measure thermal electromagnetic wave radiation emitted by the atmospheric gases these microwave radiometers are utilized in a variety of environmental and engineering applications that includes weather forecasting climate monitoring radio astronomy and radio propagation studies the performance depends on the object size different obstacles in the path of the signal in the atmospheric temperature the radiometer systems are very sensitive to Mama. microwave receiver yeah. that outputs a voltage which are related to the internal temperature so based on the output voltage the radiometer estimates with a finite uncertainty which is referred to as radiometer sensitivity or radiometric resolution This radiometric resolution is a key parameter that characterizes the radiometer's performance. An understanding of the facts or the factors that affects radiometer's performance requires an understanding of noise, radiometer design, and calibration techniques. The principal operation is that solids, liquids. gases emits them and absorbs microwave radiation the amount of radiation a microwave radiometer receives is expressed as the equivalent black body temperature which is called the brightest temperature in the microwave range several atmospheric gases exhibit rotational lines which provide specific absorption features that allows to derive information about their abundance and vertical structure of the target object so the applications of the radiometer are soil moisture snow water equivalence sea lake ice extent concentration and types can be determined sea surface temperature can be measured atmospheric water vapor surface wind speed cloud liquid water rainfall rate only over the oceans these all can be determined by a usage of a radiometer so the design is that we have an antenna we have a dick switch since it is a type of a decometer then we have the mixer a local oscillator a low noise amplifier then the total power and spectrometer to view what type of object it is so the design is the microwave radiometer consists of an antenna system the microwave radio frequency components at the front end and the back end with the back end uh, which has a signal processing for intermediate frequencies the atmospheric signal will be very weak and the signal needs to be amplified by around 80 decibels therefore the heterodyne uh, techniques are used to convert the signal to lower frequencies that allow the use of commercial amplifiers and signal processing the low noise amplifiers are available at high frequencies up to 100 gigahertz making the heterodyne techniques very absolute therefore a thermal stabilization is highly important to avoid rectified drifts there are four different types of uh, radiometers available 
one is a total power radiometer second one dicky radiometer third one satellite bone radiometer fourth one the push broom and the synthetic aperture radiometer scr so this is the dicky radiometer which was introduced by robert dicky in 1946 in the radiation laboratory of manchester institute of technology to determine the temperature of the microwave background radiation so this is the principle you can see in the diagram we have an antenna we have the switch where we have a reference t reference temperature reference and a ta which is the input temperature then it is given to an equivalent receiver input noise source which is further given to a gain section with the noise free prediction section g and a bandwidth b which is a prediction pre detection section so from the pre detection section it goes to the square law detection as we are familiar amplitude modulation then it is going to a synchronous demodulator then to the reference output where we use an integrator for doing low pass filtering so these are the necessary equations for the dicky radiometer the tolerance between two configurations where ta and tref reference are being utilized and been found out next is the synthetic aperture radiometers this is the idea of the synthetic aperture radiometer that it is using an array of racing elements multiple beams that can be formed simultaneously to image a swath this is accomplished by cross correlated signals from a pair of antennas with overlapping fields of view from the antenna array theory we know that array in an array separate apertures produce a radiation pattern that is a product of the pattern of the individual element and the array pattern however the grating lobes result from a large element spacings where a tapers or a weighting functions are used for side side lobe separation so this is a synthetic aperture radiometer which is used in synthetic aperture radars an ideal single baseline in interferometer showing the signal arriving from an off axis source and with the measurement of the real part visibility to the off axis circle the variations of a visibility function of a single baseline interferometer where the baseline is taken for 10 meters and the wavelength is 21 cm the dotted pattern as you see is the antenna pattern of an individual antenna which is assumed to be having 0.5 meter diameter the electronically steered thin array radiometer the star is another type of radiometer which is a hybrid that uses real aperture for alarm clock resolution and aperture synthesis for cross clock resolution it uses both alarm clock resolution and cross clock cross track alarm track cross track next is the hydro star concept for mapping soil and sea salinity the presence of uh, salts in sea how much amount can be determined using this hydro star so the frequency band is l band of having 1.413 gigahertz with what horizontal polarization field of view of plus or minus 450 km with the nadir point dimensions of 5.8 cross 9.5 meters antenna is having 16 wave guide sticks resolution of 30 km minimum sensitivity of 1 kilo sorry 1 kelvin accuracy of 3 kelvin or better with a mass of 500 kg and a power operating at 350 watts this is the example of hydro star which is used for soil moisture and sea salts level next radiometer is uh, the smos concept soil moisture and ocean salinity aperture synthesis in two dimensional smos 
so the frequency band which is used in this radiometer is having l band 1.413 gigahertz with vertical and horizontal polarization sequentially with the field of view of plus or minus 620 kilometers pointing of 21 degrees forward dimensions of 4.5 meter per arm antennas having 27 per arm with uh, 0.8 uh, wavelength spacing resolution of 30 to 90 kilometers sensitivity of 0.8 to 2.2 kelvin accuracy of 3 kelvin or better mass of 175 kilograms and a power of 220 watts so this theoretical pattern synthesized by y shaped antenna configuration with 23 antennas arranged in the system per arm placed at a distance of 0.89 wavelength with no weighting being applied to the individual baselines y arm y shaped antenna configuration is using smos so the smos act like which is weighting about uh, 1451 pound which is uh, 464 million dollars was launched on november 1 2009 at an altitude of 465 miles to 476 miles with an inclination of 98.4 degrees so this carries uh, l band miras radiometer that uses a y shaped antenna resembling the rotors of helicopter as you see the helicopter's rotor It will be the same shaped structure, which is a first kind of payload comprising 69 individual antennas strung together in a inferometer like array to maximize the sensor sensitivity. So this diagram, this picture is a rocket launch of this SMOS soil moisture observation satellite, which was done on November one, two thousand nine, on the Plats Cosmodrome in northern Russia. Launch of a small satellite. And this is the Miras radiometer, which was a three-year mission to investigate Earth's water cycle. That measured soil moisture with four percent accuracy, thirty millimeter resolution. That can measure. Ocean salt concentration with 120 mile resolution. So the soil moisture is a key factor in determining humidity in the atmosphere and the formation of precipitation for water. This data will also aid researchers studying plant growth and vegetation distributions. Ocean salinity maps reveal how the atmosphere and oceans interact by providing new insights on ocean circulation and which is a major driver of world climate. So this is an Amira's radiometer data, which is obtained in 2010 March over Spain. You can see that Spain showing contamination by unwanted transmissions from various radiometers. So this is the Google Earth image. This is the Amira's radiometer data. We can see that <coughs> this darker is also see this darker is also see is your contamination. Which is loose or a contamination. <clears throat> Subsequently, the Miras data taken by the S M S M O S satellite in July 2010, with the cooperation between E S A and the National Spectrum Authority. S M O S data or Spain showing far less R F A contamination. You see that contamination has been reduced as compared to this. Google Earth image versus a small satellite image taken by Miras radiometer data. Next is the satellite point radiometer. <coughs> the uh, SMOS satellite which was deployed in space was deployed with the solar arrays and instruments for uh, soil moisture, which is a key factor in determining humidity in the atmosphere and formation of precipitation. This miras it was this miras which is a radiometer which was 
launched in the esmos uh, satellite in 2009 projected the satellites that the rfi radio frequency interference were badly contaminated the unwanted signals due to these interference were uh, coming mainly from the tv transmitters radio links and networks such as security systems so these terrestrial radars appear appear to also cause some problems the same march 2010 esmos image from spain next is the micro radio meter ground based networks mrw net so this was established in 2009 by scientists working with uh, ground based microwave radio meters this was aiming to facilitate the facilitate the exchange of information in the microwave radio meter user community in order to foster the participation of coordinated international projects in the long run the microwave radio meter nets mission aims at setting up of operational software quality control and procedures data formats similar to the other successful networks so next is the radio meter calibration how to calibrate the radio meter as mentioned earlier the calibration is needed for accurate measurements if not they will produce geometrical errors which is to be checked very oftenly so for ground based uh, systems the warm calibration targets are abundant so the cold target calibration poses a challenge shown here is a uh, cryo load for calibration of radio meter antenna which was published by after hardy et al in the year 1974 in itribri transactions so this cryo load is useful for periodic calibration of modest sized antennas so when it is filled with liquid nitrogen this cold target has a radio meter temperature of around 77 kelvin so we have the vent holes here we have the aluminum sheet so this vent holes is present in this so the radio meter cal calibration may accommodate a modest sized as well as medium sized antennas that is in the shape of a bucket method that uses naturally cold sky as a cold target so this is the bucket method you can see which is in the shape of a bucket where the uh, radiation efficiency of an antenna can be measured which was done by carver in the year 1975 in itrb publications for clear sky conditions the zenith sky temperature will range between 5 and 120 kelvin using this calibration technique the antenna efficiency can be easily estimated so t sky is in, dependent on the operating frequency on the weather conditions the calibration of the space bond radio meter systems requires features that enable periodic calibration during flight so we have the nada nadir signal antenna which is given to the input switch a dic switch using a decay radio meter then an isolator then a mixer preamplifier then the intermediate amplifier then it is given to an phase discriminator of using your uh, dc amplification which is given to the analog input output so then we have the monitoring stations so this is an example of a radio meter that is used for calibration this is how we calibrate so if there is any fault we have a calibrating switch so that triggers the appropriate input switches and the mix switches by using a reference oscillator and the reference loads <laughs> 